All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning, and we just now prepare ourselves, Lord, and uh, ask you to search us, see if there's anything in us that's wicked that would keep us from hearing you. Help us, Lord, to just now deal with it and to have a free course between ourselves and God. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Genesis 28, verse 1. <laughs> what? We're just oh, yeah, we've actually made it to a new chapter now, folks. So uh, this is a monumental day. Mark it on your calendars. And uh, <laughs> all right, so we really have done it. We have done it. We've moved into the chapter 28. Isaac called Jacob, blessed him, and charged him, and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, Arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty, bless thee, make thee fruitful, multiply thee, thou mayest be a multitude of people. Give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. Okay, now, so... As Irene has announced here, we've moved <laughs> from chapter 27 to chapter 28. And when you look at it, it really, you kind of wonder, you say, are we really moved? Because this is a continuation, it seems like a continuation uh, from chapter 27. But there's a great transition here, and, and, and whoever the people were that gave these chapter breaks to, to, to Genesis, they obviously were led of the Lord to make this chapter break here. Maybe they thought that chapter 28 was getting too long, I mean 27, and they had to make a break someplace. So, But anyway, these words that start chapter 28, and Isaac called Jacob and blessed him, they are monumental in Isaac's life. Because for all of Isaac's life, he has stubbornly rebelled against God. He's been promoting this dead Esau, uh, in a sense that is dead before God. He's been promoting him, and he's closing his eyes. He's closed his eyes for all of his life to Esau's just clear rebellion against God. But finally, now, as we come to chapter 28, Isaac has thrown down the weapons of his rebellion against God, and he now is submitting himself to the will of God, and he blesses him. And we look at it, and we say, well, finally, but oh, the wasted years. Oh, the years that went by, the, the miserable years for Isaac that he res when he resisted God. What a picture for us to not be like Isaac. Don't waste the years uh, uh, holding on to something that God says no to. And, and, and if only Isaac had yielded himself to God earlier in his life, he wouldn't have been so miserable for his life. Now these words are monumental in verse 1. Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. It might as well be written, Isaac finally called Jacob and blessed him. You know, or you could write it, and, and after so long a period of time, after so long a time, Isaac finally calls Jacob and blesses him. But at least we've got the words in verse 1. He calls Jacob and he blesses him. And so Isaac, first thing we see is that Isaac had to call Jacob. Why did he have to call Jacob? Probably because Rebekah was afraid for Jacob, and, he, and, 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 and she probably told I, uh, Jacob, you go out there in those fields and get lost among those flocks out there. So Esau can't see when he goes to shoot, you know. <laughs> but but so, so she probably made Jacob scarce. And so, and so Isaac called Jacob means that Jacob had to be called. We don't know where he was, but, but, it, it, but it's interesting what it says in this verse, it's interesting what it doesn't say in this verse, actually. It doesn't say in this verse, and Isaac called Jacob and, and said to him, let me tell you what I think about you, sonny boy. <laughs> he didn't come to him and, and, and say, and scold him for deceiving him. See, he's just, been, he's just had the, the, the most major fooling and trick of his life pulled off on him by Jacob. Jacob has just taken advantage of Isaac's disability, his blindness, to swindle Isaac from the blessing. And, and what's amazing here in verse 1 is, is that Isaac does not unload his anger, doesn't load anger, doesn't load anger on, on Jacob, obviously. Why doesn't he do that? 
Irene, you know the answer to that question. Why doesn't Isaac give Jacob a piece of his mind for having swindled him? You don't know. No. Does anybody know? I thought, you know. Okay. Somebody's got to know. Nobody knows? <laughs> you think he should have really let loose on him? Okay, there we go. <laughs> so he knows it's God's will for Jacob to be blessed. And he knows he's been wrong to not bless Jacob. It's very important words in verse 1 when it says, and Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. It doesn't say that Isaac either got mad at him, and it doesn't say that he revoked the blessing that he did to Jacob because it was, he was being deceived. See, this finally shows that, 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 that Isaac, he, blind Isaac, sees he now sees that Jacob is the heir of Abraham's blessing. So these words are very important, and Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. It represents the greatest triumph in Isaac's life. So we just, Isaac has just succeeded in what's said in Hebrews 12, 1, where it says, Wherefore, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Put us on the side. Let's run with patience the race that's set before us. Okay? Isaac has just laid aside this besetting sin, which was what? He overrating Esau. He overrated Esau because of the venison and the outdoorsmanship of, of Esau. So, so Isaac has just laid aside that besetting sin, Making, making, making his belly God. And finally, he continues now to run the race that, that was set before him. See, Isaac had been marginalized. Isaac has been taken out of the race. Now at least he's able to run the final leg of the race, and, and he can run again. So in verse 1, we have these important words. And, and, and other important words is it says, he blessed him and charged him. Notice that. He blessed him and charged him. I mean, here was Jacob. He's been blessed. And as soon as he's blessed, he's charged. As soon as, bless, as soon as he's gotten the blessing, he's received the blessing, he's given a command. And, 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 and what's the command? That's it, Bill. Don't you go marrying a Canaanite woman. Don't you marry an unbeliever. We, you know, we experienced this verse in our lives. Bless him and charged him. Ja you know, Jacob, he was happy with the blessed part. But then he was expecting to, to he, 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 he wasn't expecting this immediately charged part right afterward. And we're happy with the blessed part of salvation. We didn't expect the immediate charged part. But Jacob's charged part was, the, was this, as, as Bill said, you shall, thou shalt not take a wife of the, Can, of the daughters of Canaan. See, yeah, see? And, in other words, what, what Isaac was saying to Jacob was 2 Corinthians 6.14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. See? <clears throat> because there's no fellowship between righteousness and unrighteousness. And what communion hath light with darkness? See, see it, it's to not be, unyo it might be yoked with unbelievers. To not become unequally yoked with, with, in marriage with an unbeliever. See? To, to, that was God's charged part. Don't be uh, unequally yoked. And you, you know, Jacob might have said, well, I got the blessing now, so why can't I just live the way I want to? There's some pretty cute looking gals out there among those Canaanites. I think one of them would make me really happy as a wife. I, I got the blessing. Everything's taken care of. Why can't I now just go marry one of them? See, and that's, that's why these words are important. He blessed them and he charged him said, thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. As soon as an unmarried person becomes a believer, he or she needs to be told not to marry an unbeliever. To marry an unbeliever is to take a big gamble of having a chain around your neck for the rest of your life. And we live in a world that's at war with God. And demons are behind lost people. And those demons have one intention— and that is to make trouble for the children of God. And when a believer marries an unbeliever, he just, he, he just brought one of those demons into the house. And, 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 there, and there are those who realize that, 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 they, that, that, that they needed God, and, 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 and they didn't know what to do, so, so they asked Peter. They said, Peter, 
and the rest of the apostles, well, we need God. What are we supposed to do? Tell us what we're supposed to do. And that happened in Acts 2, 37 through 40, where it says, And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? See, that was the question. What shall we do? Tell us what to do. Synagogues were good at telling them what to do. Temples were good at telling them what to do. So now they turn to God, and they turn to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, and now they say, now what say you? What shall we do? And then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. See, man, here they are. They ask Peter. They say, okay, men and brethren, what shall we do? And, and, and they knew they're far from God. They knew they're going to hell. They wanna, they, and, and they just needed to know what they needed to do. And so Peter says, number one, repent. Number two, make a public demonstration that you're serious, that you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation by being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, who's going to save you from your sin. Number three, he told him, he says he told them with many other words, but they all kind of distilled down. They all kind of boiled down to this statement in Acts 2.40. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. See, he was telling them, you look around this generation that you live in, this world, and you see it as untoward, untoward. You say, well, I don't know, what does that mean, untoward? Well, it's the, it's the Greek word, the Greek word is used here for untoward is the word scolios. Scolios, sound familiar? Yeah. A disease? <laughs> Scoliosis, right? What's scoliosis? <laughs> Crooked spine crooked spine, okay, especially if you have tuberculosis. So untoward or scoliosis, or sco, sco, scolios means crooked. It means warped. It means going the wrong way. It means it's not going to be straightened out. And so this generation is scolios. That, why, why is the world running to take away the shame for homosexuality and say it's good, it's normal, it's acceptable because our generation is scolios. They're crooked. Why does our generation find it acceptable to, to, to kill unborn children just because the comparison that would be more convenient for my life because this generation is scolios? Why is God's holy name used for swearing and it comes right into our minds in movies and right into our homes through the television set? Because this generation, our generation, is scolios. And and why, if the Bible says that the earth is created 6,000 years ago, is there this intense propaganda program in our schools, on the Discovery Channel, on PBS, you can't get away from it, where it's a constant, no, the world is billions of years old. Why? Because our generation is scolios. See, our generation is scolios. It's crooked. It's not going to be straightened out. And Peter says, Peter, Peter didn't say, go straighten out the scolios generation. <laughs> he said, save yourself from it. Save yourself from this scolios generation. See, and the first step for saving yourself from scolios generation is don't marry an unbeliever. And, and Isaac knew that to marry a Canaanite was a disqualifier for Jacob. So he charges Jacob in verse 1, thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And when Isaac told Jacob to not marry a Canaanite, Isaac finally now sees at least one part of why Esau was disqualified, why Esau disqualified himself. See, blind Isaac finally sees this. The reason why, well, at least one of the reasons why Esau has become disqualified from the Abrahamic blessing. Now we look at verses 1 and 2 together. And if we look at 1 and 2 together, they can pull these words out. Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, and then he also said unto him, Arise, go. So, I mean, this is all very abrupt. This is, keep in mind, this is all happening in one day. You know, this is, this is quite a day. 
I mean, <coughs> but among other things that have happened in the first part of this day, the second part of this day, well, actually it happened the first time too, but anyway, Jacob gets blessed. And then no sooner has he been blessed, but now he's put out of his father's house. <laughs> what a day. <laughs> and he, there, I mean, there's no time for celebration. <laughs> there's no party. You know, well, let's have a blessing for a mm, mm, Jacob party. Ble- no, he must immediately leave home. And, and, and that's an interesting pattern. It's a particularly interesting pattern for Jewish people because it's so typical that as soon as a Jewish person he gets happy. I've just been blessed with the blessing of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jacob, you have to immediately leave the house. Immediately go. See, during this last week, one of the summer blitzers came across a Jewish lady who had received the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior, but she was keeping it a secret because she knew that this was going to happen to her, that as soon as she told her family, she'd be forced to leave her home. Now we see in verse 2 that Isaac gives Jacob specific instructions of where he's to find a wife. And he says in verse 2, of the daughters of Laban. So, this, pro, I mean, <coughs> it's the first time we heard that Laban has daughters. You know? so, probably, so, so Isaac had to know that Laban has daughters. Probably he knew that she had, he had two daughters. And, and Isaac's telling Jacob, Go take, take one of Laban's daughters for a wife. Just, you know, he, he didn't say go take them both. You know, he said just take one. One's enough. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> You've got enough for trouble with one. You don't need two. <laughs> he said take a wife. Now, seeing Isaac talk to Jacob about getting a wife, this is kind of tender. I mean, you may not think it's tender, but it's the most tender it ever gets between Isaac and Jacob, you know. It's not exactly a tearjerker, but it's as good as it gets, you know, with affection be- be between Isaac and Jacob, see. And, 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 and um, you know, maybe if uh, Isaac kind of went back through the photos of his mind, you know, later on, this might have made him sad to think of the lost affection that he never had between him and his dad. But, but... But God is the source of our affection, and the arm of flesh is going to fail us. Now, we see Isaac now. He uses a very special name for God and when, he talk, when he gives him. What's the name that he uses? What's the name that, that Isaac uses for God in this chapter 28 when he's talking to, to uh, Jacob? Yeah, he says, God Almighty. God Almighty. That's familiar. Who did God first use that? Who was that name first used for? Where did we first see that name? El Shaddai. Yeah. 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 It's right. In Genesis 17, 1. He was 99 years old. And, and, and the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. I am El Shaddai, the Almighty God, walk before me, be thou perfect. And when God revealed this name to Abraham, what was the promise that God gave to Abraham when he told him this? A land. Uh, and? A land and? Salvation. And? <laughs> <laughs> a son. A son. He says, a son. In verse 19, God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I'll establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant of seed after him. So that's a miraculous son, Isaac. God actually named him before he was born. He says, I'll take the trouble away. You don't have to go through baby books. I'll give you the name. <laughs> it's Isaac. So, so, so the name of God Almighty is associated with, with a miracle of having a son. And, and, and it was emphasized because as soon as God told Abraham that, Abraham laughed. And God said, okay, there's the name. And so now, in, in this verse, <coughs> in, in this verse we're reading about, we see now Isaac of all people now using that name that was associated with his birth, with the miracle of his birth. So the name of God Almighty of the El Shaddai, is very personal for Isaac because it's that name that God used to announce that Isaac was going to be born. And now Isaac is using that name as he blesses his son Jacob. See, the name God Almighty El Shaddai is a very special revealed name 
And God spoke about this specialness of this name in Exodus 3, 6, 3, where God said, uh, he said, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, by the name of El Shaddai. See, very special name. God says, I appeared to these three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by this name, Almighty God. And that's, that's like how special it is to call Jesus God Almighty. See, the discovery that Jesus is God Almighty does not come as a result of human investigation. It comes, as it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. See, the discovery that Jesus is God Almighty doesn't come from human investigation. It comes from revelation by the Holy Ghost. But when Isaac called the Lord God Almighty, that revealed that Isaac had this special revelation, this special relationship with God. And when Isaac thought he was blessing Esau, he didn't use that name. Isaac did not use the name of God Almighty when he thought he was blessing Esau. Why? <clears throat> because the name God Almighty emphasizes a personal relationship with God, and he knew that Esau didn't have that personal relationship with God, so he didn't do it. So he didn't use that name when he thought he was blessing Esau because deep down, Isaac knew. But as Isaac uses that name now to bless Jacob, Isaac is saying to Jacob that, <clears throat> I know you have that relationship with God. And you're not going to be like Esau, who didn't care about God. So, so, so because of the time that, that God revealed this name to Abraham, the name God Almighty, it has a special meaning. And there was the meaning, is at the ripe old age of 99, and, it, and it's there as, you know, in their 90s, and they're going to tell them they're going to have a son. And, 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 and so a Abraham looks at the probability of having a child at that age, and Abraham's response is to laugh, he says, it's absolutely impossible. And, and, and <clears throat> for Abraham, it could not, it would not happen. But God knew, uh, knew that. He knew that response in Abraham, so he revealed his name in, 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 in advance. He says, I'm God Almighty. And, and that name became reserved for those, for, for, for when there was a promise of God that looked like it was going to be impossible for that to happen. That's when that name is reserved for and that name has the meaning. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ kind of didn't say that name, but this is what the meaning was in Matthew 19, 23, when it says, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. See, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said, said unto them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. See, here the Lord Jesus Christ has just told his disciples that for a rich man to be saved, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And the image of a camel going through the eye of a needle <laughs> comes fixed in their minds. A camel going through the eye of a needle. <laughs> And, 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 and they say, oh, this is impossible. But then it says something very interesting to be taken notice of in, in, in Matthew 19, 26. It says, but Jesus beheld them. That's important to see. He stopped and just looked at them and considered them. See, that phrase is so important in this scene. I mean, here's the scene. Of the Lord Jesus is saying the rich man can't be saved. It's like a camel going through the eye of a needle. They're stunned. And then it says, but Jesus beheld them. See, those words are precious because it shows how closely he monitors the response in his, in his followers. He didn't just say things and say, well, now you deal with it. That's the way it is. He didn't do that. See, when it says, I, and, and then it, and, and says in the next verse, verse 30, 24, and I say unto you, <clears throat> See? he says that. And so he says this. It's, it's a, I, you know, they were amazed in verse 25. Then, verse 26, he beheld them. Then he, it said unto them. See, four events. He spoke first. He, they responded. Second, <clears throat> he considered their response. Third, and he spoke to their response. He spoke right to their response. 
I mean, that's an important pattern. He spoke, they responded, he considered their response, he answered their response. See, that typical pattern is what we need to keep in our minds every morning when we sit down alone with God and when we read our Bibles. Because when we read our, read our, when we read our Bibles, we need to go into the evicting business. You know, we evict all those assaulting thoughts and worries that keep us from letting his words, letting the words of the Bible sink deep into us. And then we, then we need to respond to his words. And then we need to remember these words in Matthew 19, 26. But Jesus beheld them and count on him considering our response. And then the next part, but Jesus beheld them and said unto them, and count on him to respond to our response. And, and if we don't go into the evicting business and, 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 and we just mechanically go through our Bible reading without his words sinking deep into our, into our hearts and responding, then all this is lost. So the Lord Jesus has just told them it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved. The disciples are stunned. He stops. He takes time to consider how stunned they are. And then he says, with men... This is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Now they're thinking God can make a camel go through the eye of a needle. Yeah. And, and that statement is the same as when Jehovah Jesus now said to Abraham, I am God Almighty. In other words, when a situation looks absolutely impossible, that's the time to grab a hold of this special name for God, God Almighty. So there stood a, a Jacob, <clears throat> 77 years old, Mama's boy, staying in the kitchen all the time, with a death threat from his expert hunter brother, much stronger than him, being sent out alone into a hostile desert and being told, go walk alone 400 miles, over 400 miles, into Syria. <laughs> and marry one of those daughters of Laban. <laughs> so you kind of think about that. You think... You know, the idea in that setting that Jacob, and you see Jacob at that time say, he's going to become a great multitude of people. <laughs> I wouldn't have put money on that. <laughs> it looks absolutely impossible. No, that's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, looking at Jacob in that thing and thinking how he should become a multitude of people, we, 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 we might be tempted to look outside and see the camel and say, easier <laughs> for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for this little boy to become a great multitude. And Isaac knows this. And so he says, he says, he says you know what, this is the perfect time for me to pull out that special name for God that God revealed to my 100-year-old or 99-year-old father when he said I would be born El Shaddai, God Almighty. And, and so he could have said to Jacob at that time, Jacob, I know that what I'm saying looks impossible, but El Shaddai, God Almighty. Jacob, I know you don't see how it's possible for you to become a multitude, but, but with men, this thing is impossible. God, all things possible. With El Shaddai, all things are possible. That's why this name for God is so important. It's important for us, the God Almighty, because it's our, res it, our response. It's our response to a seemingly impossible situation. Of, with men, all things are possible. With El Shaddai, all things are possible. That's how in verse 3, Isaac could pray for Jacob and promise and, to God and, get, and give to Jacob the promise that God made to Abraham that would be fruitful and grow in number. Now, when we read here in verse 3 that Jacob should become a multitude of people, we think of a multitude, we think of many, many people, which it was, but the Hebrew here is not emphasizing the number. Because the Hebrew word for multitude in verse 3 is the word kahel. Kahel or, or, or kehalat. Kahel. See, Isaac is praying for a special kahel to come from, from, from Jacob. And, and we can see that, that, that what Isaac is praying for is that if we, if we look at two verses in Psalm 22, where this word is used, in Psalm 22, 22, where it says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the kahel, in the midst of the congregation, will I praise thee. And then in, Psalm 20, in verse 25 of Psalm 22, my praise shall be of you in the great kahel, in the great congregation. 
See, in both of these verses, the word kahel is, is, is well translated congregation. It's because it's referring to the congregation of the redeemed, those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. See, this special kahel or congregation is seen in Revelation 5, 11 through 12, where it says, The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. This special kahel that Isaac is praying Jacob will become is the seed that will serve the Lord Jesus Christ and they'll be the new generation, which is referred to in Psalm 22:30. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. See, this is a special kahel generation, uh, congregation here that Isaac is referring to and it's the subject of the new song in Revelation 5, 9. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou hast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. See, this special kahel congregation in verse 3 that Isaac's praying for from Jacob is a kahel from every kindred, tongue, people, nation on the earth. That, and, and that's what the high priest spoke about when he was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, this special Kahel congregation in John eleven fifty two, 52, when he says, and not for that nation only, but for that he also should gather together in one the children of God that are scattered abroad. See, this special Kahel congregation, verse 3, that Isaac's referring to is a very peculiar group of people. They've all been purified from their sins, and they're motivated. They have this special motivation to do good works, which is what it says in Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. The special kahel in, in, in verse 3, Isaac's talking about, is a generation of priests in the world that are constantly speaking of how the Lord Jesus Christ took them out of the state of darkness into the state of light, as it says in 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, the entrance, how do you get into this special kahel? How do you get into this special kahel generation, uh, uh, congregation, in verse 3 that Isaac's referring to? John 1.12 tells us, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. See, part of the group, part of the kahel, part of the, the congregation, even to them that believe on his name. So inclusion into this special kahel comes from receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as God over my life and Savior of my soul. And exclusion from this kahel in, in verse 3, is, is, is what that Isaac's talking about, happens when you do just what the verse before it says. He came unto his own, his own received him not. Okay? Exclusion from the Kahal comes when, when, from not receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as God and Savior. And this special Kahal that Isaac's referring to in verse 3 is a, is a congregation that are called the sons of God. And, and they're not in sync with the dark, dead world around them and, and they shine as lights in the dark world and they hold out the word of life to a dead world as it says in philippians 2 15 through 16 you may be blameless and harmless the sons of god without rebuke in the midst of a crooked scolios crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So when Isaac, when he saw, what, what, what he saw, what Isaac saw, when he referred to this special kahel in verse 3, was that there was going to be a person. There's a, it just doesn't not going to happen. But there's going to be a special person who's called the gatherer. He's the one who's going to gather all these people in, these different people from all the, around the world, there, to make up this special kahel. And, and this, 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 this truth that there would be a gatherer, it really got into Jacob. And, he, and it got through to him 
When he heard Isaac revealed to him there's going to be this special kahel in verse 3. See, from that point, in verse 3, Jacob, this is where Jacob first hears about this special kahel that's going to come from him. And, and Jacob, he, 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 he thought there, that then there's, there's got to be a gatherer who's going to make up this special kahel. And so from this time in verse 3, Jacob hears about the special kahel. Jacob is wondering, where's the gatherer of that special kahel? And Jacob goes on from here, and he gets married. And, and, and as a matter of fact, even though his father told him just get one life, he seemed to, wife, he seemed to like it so much, he got four wives, you know. <laughs> and he ends up having 12 sons. He'll end up having 12 sons with his four wives. And, and, and he'll look at his 12 sons throughout their lives, and he'll say to himself, you know, my father revealed to me there was going to be a special Cahel gathering. And I wonder which of my sons is the gatherer. And this question kind of plagues, uh, will plague Jacob for the rest of his life. And he's trying to figure out which of his sons is the gatherer to make up this special Cahel. And, and he looks at his firstborn. He says, well, firstborn. And Reuben, he says, oh, it can't be Reuben. He slept with my wife. He sexually defiled my wife. He's out. And, and then he looks at Joseph. Oh, my favorite son. But for the majority of Joseph's life, he's, he thinks he's killed by a wild animal. Can't be him. And, and so this question kind of plagues Jacob for his life. Who's the gatherer? And he looks at his sons, and he said, is he the gatherer? Is he the gatherer that's going to make the kahel happen that my father told him, taught me about? And, and, on, and, it was, and, and it's on the last day of his life when he's giving his final blessing to his 12 sons, and he's going from one to the other, that God opens his eyes, and he finally sees which of the sons is the gatherer to make up this special kahel. And he's amazed. And he says in, in Genesis 49, 8, Judah, thou art he, whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down unto thee. See, he says, Judah, thou art he. Yehuda, Ata, Ata, it's you. It's you. It's you, Judah. J and, and, and Jacob said with a great surprise, it was revealed to him. And he goes on to say in Genesis 49, 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. He's going to be the one that's going to make the special kahel. You're the gatherer, Judah, from you is going to come the gatherer of the people to make up this special kahel my father Isaac told me about. All my life, I've been looking for the gatherer of the, to, to make up the special kahel. And now with just minutes left to live, that's all he's got. God reveals it to him, and he says, oh, finally, Judah, Yehuda, Ata, it's you. Thou art he, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And that was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ from the tribe of Judah. He's the Shiloh, and he became the gatherer unto him and, and, and was gathered together people from every tribe and tongue and nation to make this special kahel that Isaac's referring to in verse 3. As it says in Ephesians 1.10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, and even in him. See, the special kahel gathered congregation Isaac speaks about in verse 3 is the same as the Greek word ecclesia or church. So in verse 3, we could just as easily read, and God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, and that thou mayest be a church of people, because kehel means church. And the first reference to the church is given in Acts, Acts 7.38, and where it says, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness, with the angel which spake unto him at Mount Sinai with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give them. So the first reference of this actual church or ecclesia is at Mount Sinai. Those people were called the church in the wilderness. The church had already been born in, in, in Mount Sinai in order for it to be called the church. The reference to the first church here is Mount Sinai, not the day of Pentecost. Now, verse 4 is such a clear, wonderful statement that Isaac says when he says, And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee. Thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. 
See, in this statement, we can see how Isaac emphasized the word the. Give the the blessing of Abraham. And we read that and we cheer, you know, Isaac, oh, wonderful. Finally, we get Hebrews 11.20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. Now, when Isaac told uh, Jacob that God would give him the land, it was going to be in the future. It was in the future. It wasn't now. That was obvious. It wasn't now. So Isaac speaks about uh, Jacob's current state, and he says, the land wherein thou art right now, a stranger. See, in verse 4, uh, uh, Isaac told Jacob that he would inherit the land in the future, but for now, he had to live on the land as a stranger and a pilgrim. So what Isaac told Jacob in verse 4, that's for us today. We will inherit the earth, as the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Reminds me of what Pastor Keating used to say, he wanted to inherit Maui. (laughs) And when the Lord said that the meek will inherit the earth, that was the same as Isaac saying to Jacob, God is going to give you the land of Canaan. But when Isaac said to Jacob, the land wherein thou art a stranger, that's important. Because that's the same as our current state here on earth. We are strangers and pilgrims, as it says in 1 Peter 2.11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. See, Peter called believers, he, see, when he addresses his whole letter in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout, he names those places. So Peter described, he described what believers are doing on earth. He said, if you call on the Father in 1 Peter 1.17, if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Sojourning, just like you're a traveler with the attitude, I don't really live here. And, and there's an attitude behind Isaac's words, the land wherein thou art a stranger. I, you, know, I, I, you know, I love to sail. This last Monday, Dave Hall and I went sailing. We went sailing together, and, we, and, and I, uh, I brought some pictures to see how beautiful it was out there. See? Isn't that nice? Yeah, it was really nice. So we were out there sailing. Yeah, no. Yes, no. <laughs> anyway, that's not part of my message. <laughs> and so I have a little 14-foot sailboat, and I used to sail that boat almost every week. I loved that little boat, and, and I kept that little boat in my garage you know, I was, I was all the time fussing with my boat, you know? And I, I mean, I was examining the little boat and fixing this and fixing that. And you know, there's a lot of things to fix when you put, a, when you put something of metal parts in the ocean. And so I was doing that. But, but I haven't sailed that little boat since the year 2000. Yeah. Instead, I, I just now rent sailboats. And, and I've often been tempted to buy a big sailboat, and, but I never did because I'd walk down the docks and I'd see these guys varnishing their wood, scraping the barnacles off the bottom of the boat, replacing the parts, and then sitting back in their boat, and with that, you know, this boat's mine. <laughs> and I, and I, I remember one time I was walking down the dock, and I saw a boat named, you know, My Other Woman. <laughs> and I thought about it, you know, hey, she's really high maintenance. You know? <laughs> so instead, I just rent sailboats. Uh, for the day. And I'm happy to rent sailboats. I like that. Because there's a feeling. There's a feeling that I love about renting a sailboat. And you know what it is? It's not when I get the boat and I get it. It's at the end of the day. It's at the end of the day. I love the, the feeling, the attitude that I adopt at the end of the day of renting a sailboat. And I got this little routine. And, and, I, and I, really, I really let this, and in this routine, I really let this attitude sink in at the end of the day. Because at the end of the day, I walk back up to the rental office to the key drop box. And when I reach the key drop box, I love to drop the key in the box and hear the, hear the sound of the key hit the bottom of the box. Because I, I have this little routine, and when, I hear, when I, when, and, and when I hear the key hit the bottom of the box, I say to myself, I don't own it. <laughs> I say, I don't own it. And I smile and walk away. You know? Because there's such a freedom to say, I don't own it. Yeah? Because, you know, there's a freedom from worry. Because, you know, be, because when I get on the boat, as I say, the boat, I see all the things that are broken. 
you know, the, the, the speedometer that doesn't work and the, <laughs> the cleat that's broken over here and this, this that, and this, that, you know. And I, and, I, and I say, I don't worry about that it's what's broken on that sailboat because I don't own it, you know. And, and I just use it for the day, and I'm done. You know? There's such a freedom from having this over-attachment because when I say I don't own it, I mean I don't have a special love for that sailboat because I don't own it. And, and I just use it for the day, and I'm done. And, and that's the meaning behind Isaac's statement to Jacob in verse 4, when Isaac says, the land wherein thou art a stranger. When Isaac said that to Jacob, he was giving Jacob such a freedom. And Isaac said to Jacob, the land wherein thou art a stranger, he's giving Jacob that, that great attitude, that feeling that I have when I drop the keys into the, the key box. And Isaac says that in verse 4, the land wherein I'm a stranger, he's saying to Jacob, Jacob, you're free from this land because you don't own it. Yeah? And, and just like me with the sailboat, you, you, you're, just, you're just using that land. You don't own it. You're a stranger on it. And, and, and there's a great freedom in that. And, and Jacob, you're a stranger on the land. You don't own it. So you're free from worrying about the land. Just enjoy the sound of the drop in the key box and the land and say, I don't own it. You're a stranger in the land. You, you don't own it. So you're free from overattachment. To that land just enjoy the sound of the drop you know just to, and say i don't own it and that's the take-home message for us in verse four of the words the land wherein thou art a stranger take on the attitude of a renter and say about our houses and our cars and everything we use we don't own it we only use it we're just renters everything we we use belongs to god we're only renters see that's what the the richest man in the world told us this not bill gates King Solomon, Richard. In, in, in 1 Chronicles 29, 14, he says, But who am I, and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? And then he said this, For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. See, all things come from you, and from your own have we given you. See, at prayer meeting last Wednesday, we were praying for me to buy a property in Los Angeles, and so that it would go from his property to my property, you know? <laughs> and, and someone prayed, Lord, the property is yours. <laughs> that was a wake-up call for me because that brought such a peace to me. It wasn't a matter of the property changing from his property to becoming my property. But with that prayer, it was God's property. And the question was only, which one are you going to allow to rent it? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and it brought a peace. Peace free from anxiety from the point. You could say, see, to believe what Solomon said, all things come of thee. It brings a wonderful attitude of, I don't own it. We don't own it. We only use it for the days of our lives, and it's not ours. And then we're going to hear the sweet sound of the keys dropping, hitting the bottom of the box, and say, I don't own it. See, the I don't own it attitude, it brings us freedom from worry and anxiety, over the world that's broken. And we don't need to fix it, because we don't own it. And, and the I don't own it attitude brings us freedom from the I love the world. And, it takes, and, and, and I love the things of the world. See, the I don't own it attitude brings us freedom from becoming overattached to the world and the things of this world. That's what Isaac was doing for Jacob in verse 4. In essence, he said, son, never forget my words the land wherein thou art a stranger. And when Isaac said to Jacob in verse 4, the land wherein thou art a stranger, Isaac was in essence saying to Jacob the words that John said in 1 John 2, 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. See, verse 4, the land wherein thou art a stranger, it means, Jacob, don't try to own the world or the things that are in the world. Just say, I don't own it. In 1 John 2, 17, it says, The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. See, verse 4, the land we're in outer stranger means, Jacob, don't try to own the world, the things that are in the world, because it's passing away. Just say, I don't own it. In 1 Corinthians 7, 31, it says, They that use this world, or rent this world, they that use this world is not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. Verse 4, the land wherein thou art a stranger means, Jacob, don't try to own the world, the things that are in the world. Just use it. 
Just say, I don't own it. Because one day, everyone's going to stand by this key drop box. And they're going to drop every key of what everyone had, had used on earth at during the time. And they'll be forced to say at that time, I never owned it. And, 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 and even though I thought I owned it. So it's an attitude to develop. I don't own it. I just use it. And, and that's what it means to take to heart what Jacob was told in, in verse 4, the land wherein thou art a stranger. So we'll all be able to take our place with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob. All these died in faith, dropped their keys in the drop box, saying, I don't own it. When it and, and we can see them doing that in Hebrews eleven thirteen, 13, where it says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and persuaded them, embraced them, and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. See, when they confessed in their lives that they were strangers and pilgrims of the earth, they were telling everybody, I don't own it. I only use it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for helping us today to um, walk with you and to not be attached to this world. And we pray, Lord, that the, the, the words that Isaac told Jacob would become a living reality in us, in Jesus' name. Amen.